Hey, good morning. Welcome to our life group lesson for July 26, 2020. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Jesus' teaching on living generously. Uh, so when I think of generosity, I also think of the opposite of that, which is greed. Uh, and when I think of greed, I think of a character by the name of Ebenezer Scrooge. You probably know exactly what I'm talking about uh, when it comes to him. Uh, he's the main character of A Christmas Carol, uh, which we've probably seen uh, numerous times. He can't even be moved to give generously on Christmas Day. Uh, Scrooge is this greedy guy, I imagine him, and we've seen him on like the cartoons and the other live action versions, whatever. Uh, he has like gold on his desk, things of that nature, so I have some gold today uh, as we talk about those things. So Scrooge in that uh, story, he is visited by three different ghosts, right? We know of the ghost of Christmas past, uh, we have the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas future, or, the, or, or yet to come. Now. Uh, we see different greed factors sprinkled in all throughout uh, his life and the far-reaching implications because of said greed uh, throughout uh, those future consequences that come about. So I don't know about you, but every time I watch it, I like uh, the ghost of Christmas past. I like the story there because it shows that Scrooge, oh, cool, he had a heart. Um, he had some decency. Sometimes you see like a love story. Uh, things that nature depend on what, which variation you watch. Uh, so it's like, okay, he can be kind. He has some good qualities, but he's also always compelled by money. He's always compelled by greed. Then you have uh, the, the present, uh, which we, we see he's got all this money laid out on his desk, and he's kind of a just, just an old guy who's just still stuck in his greed. But the scariest one for me is the future. Here's what's going to happen because of what you have done. Uh, there's some scary things, and it kind of scares him into like, okay, okay, I'm going to be different. I'm going to be different. Uh, and then we see the life-changing events that come about uh, throughout those things. And I'm reminded of Scripture uh, and a lot of that. And I think that story even is based loosely on some uh, on Scripture. Um, but Jesus, he didn't uh, he didn't lull his disciples to sleep and cause them to have these cautionary dreams. You know, like what happens to Scrooge. He wasn't just uh, they weren't dreaming. Hey, this is what's going. No. No, no. Jesus comes right and outright it tells them to, in, to examine their ideas about treasure, uh, tre uh, the things that you care the most about. Uh, he, he encourages them to not base their ideas on this temporal wealth. Uh, look, this is temporary. This is going to go away. Uh, but he says, look, following me, living how I desire you to live, treasuring me is far more precious than any of this stuff you can own because of your gold. Uh, in fact, Jesus says, without me, this is nothing. I don't want you to have any of this uh, if you don't have me. I am what matters most. That's what Jesus tells them. Uh, that stuff is just filth, and get it out of here. Get it out of your life. Um, so turn with me. I invite you to Scripture today. Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 12. Uh, Luke chapter 12, and I'm going to bounce uh, to a couple of different verses as well in Scripture uh, but our, our main focus is going to be Luke chapter 12, uh, specifically starting with verses 15 through 21. So if you'll dive there with me today. Uh, it starts this way. It says, And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Uh, and he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I will build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain, all my goods. Uh, and then I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. So just relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Just sit back and chill. Yeah, do what you want to do. It's essentially what he says there. Sit back, eat, drink, be merry. But verse 20, God says to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Ooh, that's like a straight up punch in the face to the rich man. Um, so the rich man, this guy has not taken care of other people. I don't see indication here. Uh, he, he reminds me of Scrooge. He's not taking care of other people. Um, and he's not been rich before God. Uh, it's, now look, it's not a sin to be wealthy. I know some people who are and are wonderful people. Uh, but it's, it's not a sin to be wealthy, 
but it says right off the bat, take care, be on your guard, be on guard and not let the love of money, the love of stuff can easily seduce you, uh, could easily seduce me uh, into thinking that eh, I don't need God. Uh, one of the biggest sins I think we have is self-reliance. We think eh, we can do it ourselves. I don't need God to do this for me. Uh, and we teach ourselves to be self-reliant. I don't need a, I don't need a man. I don't need a woman. I don't need anybody. But we all need God. Uh, so self-reliance can easily consume us and become a sin, a huge sin in our life. Uh, because hey, look at all the stuff I have. The Lord didn't give this to me. Yes, He did. He gave you everything that you have. Um, but I think what Jesus is saying here is, what is He worth to you? As I read this, what is He worth? He tells His listeners, and He tells you and I not to measure their worth by stuff, by what we possess. Um, that stuff doesn't matter at the end of the day. And by the way, he provided the means for us to have that stuff. He, he's done that. Our worth is not determined by what we do or what we have. Um, we cannot work our way into heaven. We need to stop trying to do that. Uh, there's nothing you can do, no good deeds you can do, um, no amount of money you can have, no amount of money you can give even, that is going to say, yes, this person is worthy of going to heaven because of this. No, that's not how it works. Uh, we don't earn favor. Um, we, don't own, we don't earn favor this way uh, to, to be one with the Most High, to be up there in heaven with Him, to, to live for Jesus. That, that, your stuff, is not a requirement. Uh, the temporary stuff. God is not impressed by your temporary wealth. He's just not. He's like, look, I own everything. I don't care about your little nothing money. Your little piddly money means nothing to me. He's not interested in that. Uh, our earnings, they will never amount to the priceless love that God freely gives us and freely gave us through his son, Jesus. Uh, that money doesn't matter. Our stuff doesn't matter. Um... You know, I, I want to I want to share something with you. There was a song I didn't know it uh, for years and years. I had never heard this song, um, and then we had an old worship pastor, a friend of mine, um, back in Maybank where we came from. His name was Dylan Reese. Uh, he's now a worship pastor at a church in Houston, doing a great job. But Dylan taught me a song that I'm going to share just a little bit with you today, and it is called "My Worth Is Not in What I Own." Um, it is written by the Gettys. Uh, you can look it up. It's a really cool song. I really like the Shane and Shane version. Uh, but I want to sing just a tidbit for you today. Um, but it goes like this. I think it goes in, it, it just incredibly well with this specific passage today. And it says this, pay, pay no attention to my voice. Just pay attention to the lyrics of this song uh, as it speaks to scripture. Here it is. My worth is not in what I own. Not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. And my worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame. But in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. And I rejoice in my Redeemer. Greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him no other. My soul is satisfied. In him alone. Now, ignoring my voice and any kind of cracks that I may have had, that song is powerful because our worth is not in our stuff. It is found in Jesus and for what he did for us at the cross, uh, where his blood was shed for me and you. Look, that is where our treasure needs to be stored up in Jesus and what he has done, what he continues to do for every single one of us, not in our stuff. Yet we as Americans, we love that bigger is better. We do, especially as Texans. Oh, everything's bigger in Texas. Uh, we pride ourselves on this motto um, that is really kind of a sinful motto in so many ways. Um, 
But we modern day Americans think that bigger is better or newer is better. All right, we got to get a new phone, new this, new that all the time. And how do we, how do I know that we think this way? Well, look around you. Two thirds of Americans are considered obese. Now, obese is 30 pounds overweight, 30 pounds or more overweight. Two thirds of us are, uh, two thirds of us in America are obese. Um, how do I know we think bigger is better? Since 1973, houses uh, have almost doubled in size. The average home has doubled in size. Homes in 1973 uh, averaged about 1,500 square feet, whereas today, uh, or actually 2015, it's 2,657 square feet. That's the average home. We have to have bigger, we have to have more. Uh, those two bedrooms are now four bedroom homes. We have to have more, we have to have bigger. Um, you know, Big Macs, right? Whoppers, uh, supersized, go get me a grande drink at Starbucks, Subway, let me get my foot long. We are all about bigger, 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 bigger. And enough is never enough because we're consumed with greed. Um, my, you've heard this before, but you can't take this stuff with you. You know, I never heard, uh, I don't think you're going to hear a dying man on his deathbed say, man, I wish I had spent uh, more time with my money. No. They used to say, man, I wish I had spent more time with my family. I wish I had done this better. I wish I had done that better. I wish I had taught my son to do this. Nobody says, man, I wish I had worked on uh, anything, worked on this more and attained more and gotten more money. And hey, you know what? When I die, why don't you put all this gold, all this treasure with me? Put my truck in there with me. It's not going to fit. Put this food with me. It's not going to happen. Put this... Uh, it's just not going to happen. My cool gadgets, my phones. Hey, bury all these phones with me. No, uh, nobody does that. You cannot take it with you. Um, you know, we could be buried along with every single treasure we own, and we still wouldn't be able to carry those treasures up to heaven. They're just not some big wagon we're going to carry with us. No, we're supposed to carry our cross daily with us, not our stuff. That stuff weighs you down. It's your baggage. can't store those things up in heaven. Now, let me say this. It's not necessarily wrong to have nice things. Uh, the woman, for instance, who prepared uh, Jesus for burial, uh, she did so by anointing his feet with expensive oil. Turn with me to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. So um, she wasn't rebuked for doing so. This is neat to me. So a woman came up to him, and this is when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. A woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Wow. So she was commended for her faith instead, not because she used some expensive oil, but because she had faith. So nice things, uh, they're, they're not the issue. Nice things become an issue when we hoard them for ourselves. I gotta have more, I gotta have more. And, and it's all for us and it's all for our glory instead of using them to advance God's glory and advance God's kingdom. So at that point, they become what? An idol. Those things are more important to us than our God. So in the hands of God who blesses us with them, our treasures can be mighty tools for the kingdom. Uh, they can be great things for him. Um, God wants... Uh, we, he wants us to invest our time and our material possessions even. Yes, and our talents. Uh, he wants us to invest them in his kingdom work. So yes, invest your money, but invest them in things that are of the Lord. Uh, do things that are godly. Uh, do things that are for his kingdom to build others up, to, to have a right relationship with Jesus. Um, because guys, God is the true owner of everything we have anyway. So yeah, give it back to him, um, but build up others along with it.
build up his kingdom. Uh, our true treasure cannot and should not be found here on earth, but in heaven, but in Jesus and Jesus alone. Um, to God, we need to give the best that we have. We need to give it regularly. We need to sacrifice it to him. It needs to be a sacrificial gift. Like, Lord, I'm, I may not have this because I'm giving you this. That's okay. Uh, sacrificial gift. We need to be humble about it, not boasting and telling everybody, look how much I gave. Look at me, look at me, look at me. I gave, no, don't do that. But we need to be a cheerful giver as we do these things, whether it be in tithes and offering, whatever you do in life, uh, good deeds, things of that nature, do them all for the sake of the Lord, not to say, man, look at all the nice things that I do for the world. Look at me, look at me, look at me. No, it's not about you, it's about him. Uh, pray that God glorifies uh, what we're giving. That's why we pray over our offering in church. That's why hopefully you pray every day uh, as you offer things to the Lord. Um, God, here, I don't know what you want done with this money, but I want to give it, Lord, so that it can further your kingdom. And so when we give it to, to the church, things of that nature, the church then in turn uses it for various ministries to build up uh, the kingdom. Uh, now, sometimes those ministries aren't effective, and so we need to figure out different ways to use that money uh, more effectively. Uh, but make no mistake about it, we aren't to hoard that money. We aren't to just hold on to it, look at us, look at how much money my church has. No, uh, we need to be freely giving it. Uh, for the kingdom. Uh, turn with me, or, or continue in Luke 12. We're back in Luke 12. I want to read verses 22 through 28. Uh, we're going to talk about anxiety for a minute here. Verse 22 starts off this way, and he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, uh, about what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Verse 24 is kind of weird. All of a sudden, boom, he says, consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? That is huge. I want to go back to that, um, specifically talking about this year. Uh, verse 26, if then you were not able to do it as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Even Solomon in all his cool stuff, he didn't look as good as these things that are from me. Verse 28, but if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Mm. So this goes along very well with Jesus uh, last week, his teachings on prayer that we talked about. He's teaching the disciples how to pray. We don't have to worry and think that God is going to forget us because he doesn't. He never forgets us. He doesn't forsake us. He already cares for us. Um, worry is is a is just as bad a sin as those other ones. Sin is sin, but worry is a sin that we can all fall into. Look at verse 25. Which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? So many of us, oh, we have a lot to worry about. We are racked with stress right now. Our society is inundated with stuff going on. We have uh, I don't even, not even talking about COVID-19. We're, we're, I'm talking political stuff and job loss and stress with my spouse, stress with my kids. Uh, are we going to go back to school or not? Um, There's so many things that are just stressing us out. Verse 25, which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to your life? Don't be fearful. Don't fret. Anxiety, worry, depression, those things can creep in. I have felt them myself. All of those, okay, uh, uh, during this time, during the season of life and of ministry. But when we worry about the things of this earth, what we show God is that our focus is not on the eternal goodness uh, and his provision. Uh, but instead, we're worrying about unknown surroundings and circumstances, fear of the unknown. And God says, look, you may not know, but I do, and I have a plan for this. And in this and through this, I'm going to use you in this but you need to focus on me. Uh, we're not. Oftentimes we're not focused on him because, oh my gosh, I'm, don't worry about tomorrow because today has enough of its own junk going on. Don't worry about tomorrow. Get through today and praise him for it. God, I thank you for this. In the morning, in the evening, all of it, I praise you and I give you all the praise and glory you so rightly deserve. So Jesus, when I look at this, this passage here, he points out the lilies of the field, they don't work 
right? They don't have the capacity to, for work. They don't, they don't have a way to worry. Um, and yet they're completely, 100% taken care of because God provides for them. Uh, he talks about Solomon. Solomon, uh, he didn't have to worry about anything. Materialistically speaking, he had everything. Uh, he had prayed uh, for wisdom and he had it. And he had used that wisdom to, and he had so many things. He had a lot of stuff. Um, but he wasn't as glorious as the lilies of the field. God cares for the fragile flowers uh, that don't have eternal souls. So how much more does he care about you as his children? Uh, so much more. It's unbelievable. He cares about us. He loves us. He knows that our needs are not just materialistic things. Mm -mm. They're deeply spiritual. We are exponentially worth so much more to the Father. It's not even close. So I don't care if you're as rich as can be or you're the poorest in God's kingdom. He will supply all of your needs, all of them. So let's move down to verse 31, 31 through 34. Instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Verse 32, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Verse 33 is tough, but here it is. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. And then verse 34, if, if we had a memory verse, this is it. Okay, Luke 12, 34. Here it is. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, I want you to really think of that verse. That's a memory verse. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Uh, just think of one, two, three, four. It's Luke 12, 34. Uh, just think of the basics. There it is. Um, so the nature of our hearts is shown in what we value most. What are your priorities? Uh, I work in the banking, or I worked in the banking industry for about seven, eight years or so. Um, and I, if, if somebody came in and had an issue with their finances, I would sit down with their statement and I would show them various things. And I could always tell you what their priorities were. And it was typically feeding their face. Uh, well, we're midway through the month and you've spent 75% of what you earn on going out to eat, for instance. And I would see that all the time. Hey, you might buy groceries instead and make them at home instead of going out to eat every day. Uh, those are just some thoughts I have to try to assist you. Uh, so that's what I would tell. Kind of, but you could tell, hey, this is where my love was. And it was in, it was in stuff. Um, sometimes people would buy groceries and still go to the restaurants every day. Why? Uh, your time management skills are very lacking in that. Uh, well, I don't have time. I work so often that I can't go home and make the stuff that I bought. So I got to go grab something to eat. And hey, I've been guilty of that. I think we all have. But time, in a lot of ways, can become an idol as well. Uh, we have to manage our time better. Uh, we need to have some daily time with the Lord. We need to be grateful for the time that we have with him. Um, but your priorities, I can easily tell you what, you what you like, what your priorities are if I looked at your bank statement. And it's the same thing. God knows what our priorities are. Um, God's provision for us extends way beyond daily bread, though, uh, way beyond just what we're going to eat. Uh, it goes more than that. Uh, his eternal provision uh, that he provides for us is exponentially greater than that through the person and the work of his son, Jesus. And that is far more important than our, our temporary stuff. The temporary needs, our, our, our temporary water and drink needs, or excuse me, water and food needs. Um, those things are temporary. And Jesus says, look, I have given you living water in my son, Jesus Christ. That's what you need to be focused on. He doesn't promise us a life of ease. Please, please catch that. Nothing about what he is saying says this is going to be easy it's going to be a cakewalk yes no he doesn't say that he in fact promises his disciples the exact opposite and if you want to be a disciple of jesus you want to follow him with everything you have you're not going to have a life of ease you're just not going to happen but what he does say is he promises that our eternal well-being will always be secured so let me let me ask you this what is the antidote to anxiety well, how do i not be anxious Verse 32 sums it up. Fear not, because it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Knowing that God's pleasure is to take care of me, that's why I don't have to be anxious, because Jesus, you are near. You are right here. You are with me. You never forsake me. 
I'm so grateful for that. Our greatest treasures aren't things, uh, our greatest treasures aren't things that we hold in our hands. They're not. Uh, the greatest treasures are not our stuff. Our greatest treasures are things in heaven. That's where our, our, that's where our treasures need to be. And he has told us exactly where our hearts should be. In Matthew 12, 30, where he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength. He should reign number one in our lives. And we need to love him with everything we have, not our stuff. Our stuff doesn't matter at the end of the day. Now, I wrote down a few questions. There's a couple of answers, and I want you to kind of ponder on some things as you're watching this. Uh, thank you for watching it this far. I appreciate that. Um, but I hope you're catching something from this. How can we balance this idea of trusting in God to meet all of our needs? Uh, how, how, do we, how do we do that? Um, now, that's not an invitation to sit back and be lazy. No, God doesn't want you to do that. Scripture says otherwise. Uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, 3 and verse 10 says, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So God's like, no, I, I don't want you to be lazy. La laziness is rebuked. If you look in Proverbs chapter 6, um, laziness is not something that we should be doing, uh, period. But God is saying, hey, I'm the sustainer. God sustains us. He takes care of us. Um, what's cool to me here is much like ministry, God doesn't need me. God will still do his thing. People will still uh, come to him because he, he does that. God says, look, I will work in this person's life, Daryl, if you don't, but I want you to come alongside me. I want you to do this ministry. I want you to, this is what you've been called to, uh, to student ministry. Uh, but, I, you know, I seek to reach others as well, not just students. Um, but God, God uses me. He chooses me to do that. That's really cool to me. Well, in the same way, he's like, I want you to work. I don't want you to be lazy. Okay, so I'm going to choose you to do this task. But you need to trust in me that I'm going to supply all your needs. Now, some of you may have heard, well, the more money I have, the less I have to worry. I don't think that's true. Uh, I know a lot of people can fret about bills not being paid because they don't have enough. But... I just don't think the more money you have, the less worry you have. Uh, we live in a very wealthy nation, the United States, a very wealthy society. Yet we worry constantly. I, I, I mean, look at us. We worry all the time. I see it. You see it. You do it. Um, I do it. So the, the more we have, the more we worry about how am I going to hold on to it? How am I going to hold on to, the, to this stuff? How am I going to manage it? How am I going to maximize it? How do I make it more? How do I make it grow? So let me ask you this. What if we treated our relationship with God like that? <laughs> Asking those same questions, right? Uh, how do I hold on to it? How do you hold on to your faith in Jesus? That's a fantastic question that you should be asking yourself. How do I, how do I hold on to this? How do I manage it? And how do I maximize it? How do I hold on to this and maximize it? How do I maximize it to spread love, spread joy, spread peace to, to people, to the masses out there who don't know Jesus? How can I maximize that? That's what matters. That's what matters. And finally, this, this question here. How does our heavenly treasure influence the way that we see and handle our earthly treasures? Okay, here it is. Again, God gives us everything we need. I've said that over and over here. All that we possess, every bit that we have, it belongs to him. This is yours, God. Take it. So here's the deal. It's yours anyway. You see my hands? They aren't tight-fisted. No, you're not going to pry this out of my hands, God. No, we aren't to be tight-fisted with this. With what we have, this money is not yours, this stuff, it is not yours, it is his. So hold these gifts out with loose hands. God, I am prepared to give this to you because I don't need it. I need you. You give me everything I need. I need you. And when I'm done with that, I need more of you. That's what we need. That's what our nation needs. That's what our church needs. That's what our society needs. It is not more stuff. It is more Jesus. That's what we need. Give it back to him. It's already his. Worship him. Be generous for him. But everything we do should be for the glory of our Savior. Every single thing that we do. Our true treasure is 
Jesus. Uh, that's the easy Sunday school answer a lot of people love to give. Jesus! Well, our true treasure, where is it? Who is it? There's your answer. Jesus. I hope you have a great day, and uh, God bless.